Welcome everyone, I'm Dinat and uh, I'm also working in the pen testing, pen testing business. Uh, I also have a company, it's called Silent Signal and we also publish lots of open source stuff. We have our, our own GitHub uh, group or I don't know, organization I think it's called. It's on github.com slash silent signal and we, we try to publish, uh, publish as many things as we can. We also have a tech blog where you can read about interesting technical stuff and uh, today I'm going to publish information uh, again about technical matters and I try to, to try to find the abstract, abstract information behind all this stuff. So we have to do lots of web penetration testing because web is the platform that's not really posh but it's widespread because it's easy to deploy for most organizations as opposed to for example thick clients and stuff like that and uh, we find some applications during these tests which are really complicated because you know in the beginning the web was really just a really simple system designed by Tim Berners-Lee that allowed you to request pages from a web server and then get some reply. So, for example, when you have a burp, which is, is capable of, of displaying HTTP requests and responses, you look at some requests like this uh, ping PHP request, and it has a request, it has a response, I don't know if you can read it. In the request you say get, you say a page, and the response you have the body of the page and and some things called headers which usually can be metadata. It's simple but people wanted to build applications out of it and uh, when you want to when you want to correlate requests because say you try to build an application that runs in your web browser obviously it runs on the server and the web browser is acting like a dumb terminal then you'll have some problems because most, most of these web hacking tools actually concentrate on seeing a single request and when you try to attack the server it tries to manipulate the values you sent in those requests. So for example in this case I built a simple ping application. Maybe you've seen similar stuff in your Soho router where you can do a ping to a server you know what ping is, right? So you send ICMP echo packets to another host and when you receive ICMP echo reply packets then it displays those. But if you are really in a bad relationship with the command line, here's a web interface for you. You enter how many packets you want to do. I say four. I say continue. And then it says which host to ping. I will say local host because we still don't have Wi-Fi on this event and I say continue and it starts loading it takes one second to send each one so it waited four seconds and yeah I got a reply with a really low TTL it's good because it's localhost so yeah it's, it seems like a good web application and uh, here's the source code for it it's PHP I know everybody hates that but at least it's it's easy to deploy because like I said it's usually complex, complex applications that we try to test, but I wanted to do a simple application where I can demonstrate these issues and anybody can download this. It's already on GitHub. It's really easy. You see, uh, we start the session. You know, session is where the PHP tries to store some kind of information that is persisted between requests because otherwise the web is a stateless platform. But this is how you can make it stateful. So in this case, uh, let's try with the first one. If nothing matches, then we display a static page, which is the first page where it asks for how many packets you want to send. And then when you submit it, it will store the count in the session and then display the second page where it asks for the host name. You remember that? And when both the host is sent and the session uh, has the count, then it will do this system call which executes a command in the operating system and displays the output and then in the end it unsets the count 
so that the session, the session is restored to where it was not the first time. So if I just hit enter in the browser, I'm back at the first page. Most people, when they see the source code, can spot the vulnerability just at sight. You see, I don't perform any kind of validation or sanitization on this variable, so if I put the right values in these variables, which come directly from user inputs, I could execute any kind of commands on the server. But can an automatized system actually discover this kind of vulnerability? And, and one of the core thoughts in my talk is, is really about Many people ask about automatized tools versus manual testing, and th this, is, this, this is a question our company gets asked a lot, because there are lots of companies in the market providing these automated tools, where they say, yeah, I run this scanner and that scanner on your web page, and this will tell you whether your site is secure or not. And we always say, yeah, automated tools are great, but only if operated by a human with knowledge and security. Because it's, it's not the tools that make me... I mean, we are at a hacker conference. We all know what a script kid means. You know, so... For example, in this case, I will first demonstrate what Burp does. Burp, maybe not everyone knows it, is a really great web application pen testing tool. It has a proxy built in. And I've set up in that browser you've seen before, it's set up as a proxy, so all the requests I send can be reviewed here. So when I first post my, my count, it's posted here as count equals four. Maybe it's even readable if I don't highlight it. In the second request, I send the host name. And then in the response, I get the usual output. So, well, I can just say, do an active scan, but that, for that I have to add it to the scope. And then the scanner started. It started sending requests. Fortunately, it's quite fast because it's on the same machine, and it says finished, and it says three issues, so it must be good, right? E nope. Arbitrary host header accepted. Who the hell cares about that? Host header poisoning, okay? Cross-site request forgery. So, ha do you actually see any serious issues? Because I don't. And this is a problem. You see, you see, if you only try to send the same request over and over again, the, the session is, is, is in an invalid state. So, so, the scanner doesn't know that this page is requested within a session, and it would need to re-establish the session into the same state after every request, because it's just a dumb scanner. And, and sure, it could be automated for this particular application, which I will do in a few minutes, but it cannot be automated to do it for every web application in the world, so that's that's one reason why there is still a need for manual penetration testing, which can be aided by tools if those people are, have the knowledge to actually use those tools in a responsible manner. So in this case, I'm going to demonstrate how to do it with Burp and then how to do it with an alternative tool. But first, I'm going to show you an even better example, which is a traceroute functionality where we'll even use a nonce. Nonce means the number used once. And it, if you've ever tested some uh, Java Faces applications, you might recognize uh, this kind of pattern where the server has a, has a state of a graphical interface and the client has a state. And the client all, only sends the deltas between these state transitions. So if the server and the client become desynchronized, then the whole application will misbehave. Thus, you will find false negatives, which means the scanner will say there are no vulnerabilities, where there could be vulnerabilities if you would have tested it in a better way. So in this case, I show it in the browser as well. Enter host to trace route to. Okay, seems straightforward. And localhost is pretty easy to trace. 
but if we take a look at the requests we send when I got the page there was a value called nonce and it has this random garbage in it and I had to send it with the next post request so you have the host name localhost and then you have the nonce and as you can see from the source code the nonce is generated and then stored in the session and then at the next request it is checked whether this nonce in the session matches the one you sent so if I were to try to resend this request it, it, won't, it won't work because the nonce was already used the server if you see unset it, unsets it so it won't even execute the vulnerable call so then again I, I can just show it to you if you'd like I do an active scan on this post oh sorry I didn't add it to the scope I say do an active scan and they say yeah I'm doing an active scan and after a few hundred requests it says again that oh we have three vulnerabilities which might be familiar from the previous scam okay how can we solve this problem I mean it's pretty obvious that the problem we need to solve is we should try to make the the scanner software restore the state to, to the known state where we know that the request that we are currently testing can be sent you know it's like pressing the reset button every time before a test maybe people who write unit tests as developers know this situation where a testing harness has to put the system back into the initial state so that the tests can be run independently and this case is the same you have to run all the test cases independently it's just that these test cases are designed to display vulnerabilities instead of simple functional bugs so what we are going to do uh, in burp it's a gui tool it has many options you can configure it and it's it's a bit hard so bear with me so first of all we have this tool called project options in the newer versions all the versions didn't have that it was another other tab another page and it has sessions maybe you can see it and currently uh, the only session handling rule is use cookies from burbs cookie jar which already addresses a similar problem as to what happens if during the scanning some new cookie arrives and it tries to apply that and as you can see it's already set up so that only the scanner and the spider uses it so we can add the new rule let's call it camp and first of all you can decide you can define a scope where this will be used and we already know that we added it to the suit scope so we can use that and you can also select what kind of tools should this apply to so in our case for example repeater is great because we can test manually there and then you can set up actions which happen when that when that rule is hit so if I say you, you can add many actions what I want to do is run a macro the macro is what I earlier described as something that sets the state back to the initial state and in this case it means that I can record these things I can select any previous request and try to use it in this case I will only use the get you can select multiple requests of course and you can you can try to configure how to extract the values as you can see there is one called custom parameter locations in response and this is what we want to do because we want to extract the nonce value so that we can reuse it in the attack request so in this case I will say add parameter name is nonce because that's what we want to overwrite and then the nice thing is I could write a regex by hand or I can write uh, I can define some expression but the nicest thing is that I can just select it with the mouse and it will generate either a regular expression or the kind of expressions that define the start and the end and I don't have to possibly it, it usually works quite well and if I say okay it says that yeah nonce will be extracted from yada 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 string to yada 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 string well let's hope it works 
So now we have a macro which extract nonce, so we can say nonce extractor. And then, okay, this macro will be run. It will issue a GET request. What will happen next? And I could say, yeah, update all parameters except for, and I could put up a blacklist, what not to uh, update, or do a whitelist below. Actually, we only have the nonce, and we want that to have, want to override that. So actually, the empty blacklist is quite okay with us. So this is the simplest use case. And then I say okay. So we have we return to the base window. Yeah, I know it's deep. We have to go deeper. So the, what we defined is a session rule which will apply to the suit scope, so it will apply to the trace root call, and what it will do is run a GET request and extract the nonce, and then overwrite the attack request with this nonce value. Is this somewhat clear? Good. So now, if I send this, where is this? If I send this POST request to the repeater, which is a simple HTTP client, then I get a response. And even though I send new packets, I can see that the nonce is changing. Can you see it on the left? So burp is doing all the work for me, which is kind of great. So now if I say do an active scan again, let's see if it's a bit different. Of course it will be much slower because it has to send twice as many requests. So be careful with this kind of stuff because you can actually break servers with it, uh, especially if they are written in Java. I mean, so it's working, it's sending requests. Why is it so slow? It's always slow when you do a live demo. But uh, probably it's because it's sending uh, uh, such combinations that it tries to, uh, you know, when you have a command injection, the easiest way is that if there is no, uh, nothing in the response, you can still try to send sleep commands so that the whole response will be delayed. And that is something you can measure easily. And as you can see, it's already finished. And Java redraws the screen. Maybe we have, we can have some drum roll here. Yeah, Java is great. Have I ever mentioned that? And we have an OS command injection. Wow, something has changed. You can see that it puts some pipe characters into it, which is interpreted by the shell spawned by the system, and it got these values echoed. You can ask why is it, uh, why is it just high and firm, whereas it could be uh, certain and not firm? This is because something else could have echoed those values back and it would become certain if I would have access to the internet because then it could have sent, you know, uh, comments like, like uh, query a host on the internet and that host will connect back to us. This is known in Burp as the collaborator. That is one feature that cannot be found, as far as I know, in any other web tool, including the Zap. And I, I, I highly recommend you to try it. Well, you need an internet connection for that. So this is how Burp finally found it. And first of all, I hate Java. I hate graphical user interfaces. So I will show you an alternate approach because, you know, more solutions is much better than few. So. Meet comics. Comics is a really great uh, thing. What it does is it's tailored at command execution discovery. It's a, do you know SQL map, SQL map? It's the same but for command execution. And it's much better than the burp one because burp can only discover such vulnerabilities while comics can actually exploit them. So it's more of an attack tool. And you can say that, yeah, I want to I want to connect this URL and I want you to use cookies and I want you to send this data and you have to mark uh, the vulnerable parameter with a star, an asterisk. But if I run it in itself, 
What? Localhost is unreachable. Great. I love this software. So if you if you try, sorry. Yeah, maybe. Who cares? <laughs> I love this stuff. Okay. Well, obviously it wouldn't find this vulnerability as much as as uh, as Burp didn't find it. But if I could. Uh, put a proxy in front of it that would perform the same task. Mitten proxy is a bit like Burp's proxy module and it's console based and it's written in Python and you can write so-called inline scripts which modify the request in a particular way and in this case I've written one called you know traceroute.py because it's for this example and what you can do is define I mean Mitten proxy defines some hooks which can be defined here and they will be called at uh, specific moments within handling a request or a response. In this case, request is called when the request is sent but before the request is actu actually goes out on the wire. So in this case, I ask the actual request object because through this flow parameter you can access every aspect of the HTTP request. We have to extract the cookies. This is actually just a format conversion because this one is a list and we want uh, a dictionary object. This is called a dictionary expression in Python because you can just build a dictionary on the fly. And then I request the original page with the same cookies so I stay within the same session. And, in the re and I parse the response with AlexML and thank you Stefan for introducing me to AlexML. It's a really great library with the HTML parser. I use the HTML and not the XML parser and I get the tree back and on this tree I execute this XPath query and I say I want an input field which has the name attribute nonce and I want the value. If you look at it, the HTML file, you can see that Actually, the nonce is sent in a hidden field called nonce, so it's actually what will get extracted. And then I just parsed the the items in the body. You see, the the body in the attacker request is like this. So parse QSL will just turn this string into a simple. Uh, list which contains the yeah, host equals localhost nonce equals this number and then I update the nonce to this new value and then do this encoding in reverse and put it in the content so if we could divide it into two parts this part gets the nonce sorry this part gets the nonce and this part overwrites the nonce in the request and then let the request go to the original uh, destination. So it's the same what Burp does, but it's in Python, it's much more flexible and it doesn't require Java or graphical user interfaces. <coughs> and if I start Mitten Proxy in this way, it takes a bit of a time. Yeah. And then I say, I add proxy. And let's hope it won't say that network is reachable. It's starting to get interesting. Why would you require an internet connection for that? Hmm. What the? <laughs> Now that is interesting. So to get the HTTP IP address, it connects to Google. <clears throat> and this is kids, how you do live demos. Uh, 
and why does it oh sorry I have to come on that as well so now without proxy to show you that it fuck you that it wouldn't discover it without it yeah it's hmm Okay, this is a secure application. Comics didn't find anything. Nothing to see here. Move along. You, you see, this is the time-based injection, what I said before. And yeah, now it's, it's trying to ask for help from me. All right, you see? And if I say proxy is at localhost, and it uses mitten proxy, wow, it seems injectable. Do you want a shell? Of course we want a shell. ID, yay, we are running with DNAT. Oh, and we have a really old kernel. We should do some local root privilege escalation exploit in it. So, as you can see, if I would have believed it, it would have said, yeah, it's not one of, it's the mitten proxy screen. You see, it's much better than burp. So, as you can see, if you use tools which are automated but have an operator that knows how this stuff works then you can achieve really great results and and i think I, i've heard that some companies uh say that yeah you shouldn't use automated tools because it will break the system and and automated tools are bad no i think automated tools are great because humans have certain negative values as well so for example humans tend to make mistakes but if you set up an automated tool in the right way, it will, for example, test every variable. Human could mistakenly leave out some variable. It happens. But if you combine an automated tool, which is configured by a great human operator, then, well, you won't have false negatives anymore. And this is the same for false positives. I mean, I've seen uh, Nessus reports, which are thousands of pages long, full with 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 information about yeah this is vulnerable that is vulnerable no that is not vulnerable you need some human who could parse the output and generate a report so yeah i think both both false negatives and false positives could be much 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 lowered if we would have people with the right knowledge and the right tools questions Which tools? The, the, this kind of workflow, uh, testing. Uh, sadly, more and more. So it, it seems that our clients who are more conservative than the average, average tech user because they are financial institutions like banks and, uh, and other kind of stuff, they they just reached to the point where they started using these uh, server client synchronized stuff where you actually this is the only way where which you can test the applications so it's more and more while on the other side there are more clients using apis which have a clean stateless design which are actually better testable with this so it's it's an interesting thing that 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 uh that leads into two directions at once. So we have more people using this Java Faces style of stuff and also more people building clean APIs. But we have to use it more and more. Other questions? Which one do you prefer? Or what is? I mean, which one do you use more often? Uh, also, I guess. Despite my thoughts. Uh, I usually try to combine it. You see, the problem with mitten proxy is that it's only a proxy, which, is, which has pros and cons as well. So it's a good proxy because it focuses on doing one thing and doing that great. The problem is that the scanner of burp is something that, that doesn't really have a match for. So for example, in lots of cases, I will use burp to discover issues like a SQL injection or a command injection like this, and then use comics or SQL map to actually exploit the issue because, because burp is incapable of that. And while, 
while I appreciate the work the Burp developers do, that's why we pay for their product, and really appreciate that they made it possible to extend functionality using that plugin interface, which is also great. I've written many plugins for Burp. At the same time, that API doesn't really expose every, every kind of thing you can do in Burp. So there are many things in Burp which could be improved, cannot be improved through the API interface, and because it's closed source software, there is no way to do it without some serious reverse engineering that would probably be crippled with the next update. So, uh, so far our, I couldn't find the holy grail of web penetration testing softwares. I use both of them and, and each of them has their highlights. So there's no VI, Actually, it's kind of like that. There is there is a war and there is no clear winner. Obviously, VI. Yeah. Well, well it's, it, it could be detected, but the thing is that it's usually quite easy to spot it by the eye. So these kind of applications have all the telltales. So if you work in this, this area, you will see it maybe even just by looking at the browser and not even looking at the actual requests in Burp. So uh, it could be detected maybe, but I, I didn't even try to implement it. Anything else? You can also download, uh, I, I've written a paper about it for my GWAPT certification uh, upgrade to the gold status. You can download it in the GIAC uh, reading room and it has roughly the same information and the source code is up on GitHub so if you want to try these for yourself or even make make a better combination than I did with the burp and the mitten proxy and the comics then do so and thank you for listening <laughs>